Greetings, everyone. Here we are, back at it. We're still at toward the end of realistic mindfulness. To recap, and I think I'll start with the recap, which is the last paragraph I read in the previous session, I'll just refresh your mind since it's been a week. To recap, the realistic view is knowing the four truths, the friendly facts, processes of causation of suffering and cessation of suffering. Motivation, realistic motivation is nonviolence, free generosity, and non-alienation, working against one's psychosis of feeling separate from reality. Realistic speech is honesty, diplomacy, sweetness, and meaningfulness. Realistic evolutionary action is non-killing, non-stealing, non-abuse of sexuality, and non-abuse of speech. Realistic livelihood is ethical living, non-harmful. Realistic creativity is clearing the mind of negativity and sustaining the positive. Realistic mindfulness, which is we just are finishing, is lucid waking awareness of what is, experiencing it fully, without craving, and without fear and anxiety and worrying. And finally, realistic concentration is moving into expanded embodiment through moving the mind up through the divine abodes of immense love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the four contemplations and realizations that open for the patients, the practitioners, the performers, their own inner heavenly nature, which then can manifest right here on earth. So that's the last chapter. I will return to the eighth of the Eightfold Path in the forthcoming chapter. So the Buddha concludes this discourse I'm now back, at the, and the discourse, remember, is the great mindfulness foundations or the great focuses of mindfulness discourse. Foundations of mindfulness is how people translate it, but with uh, patana, but upasana means where you place your mind. So, of course, you place it on a foundation, but it's where you focus it, your mindfulness. So I don't like the foundation one, since foundation is the idea is you depart from a foundation. In this case, you're focusing on uh, these four things, right, which we've just gone over, which are the body, breath and body, sensations, mind itself, and mental contents, right? So he concludes this discourse, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, which is a Pali discourse in the Theravada level of the foundational level of Buddhist practice for the mendicants mainly, but also for lay people. But with the five precept uh, laymen's, laypersons vow, but mainly for male and female mendicants. This guided therapeutic, he includes it, this discourse which is a guided therapeutic meditation by telling the patients that they can attain the neuronic cessation of freedom from suffering in either seven years or seven days. <laughs> I love that. That is really encouraging. Though we must remember he is addressing mendicants, i.e. dropouts, that means those who live by alms, wandering without, from, who live homelessly. They live in wandering except during the rainy season in India. They wander from village to village, living in temporary, under trees and things, and only during the monsoon do they accept a, a roof, being under a roof. Because they are, they have, they have retreated. They have resigned. They have transcended from home to homelessness. Dropouts from the household life, who are given free lunch, only lunch or brunch rather, before noon, by the rich and tolerant Indian society, to be on permanent retreat, to just focus on learning, thinking, and realizing, lucid, lucid waking mindfulness, all the time except for eating, sleeping, and bathroom functions. We all tend to be a bit more distracted, what with multitasking, working, taking care of family, 
and diverting ourselves all too easily. So maybe we need something more like 49 days, seven years or 49 days, being mostly laypersons here in America. In another discourse in the universal vehicle context, the Bodhisattva Manjushri leads a divine student through a more explicitly self-transcending virtue, version rather, of the four focuses of mindfulness. And I'm reading from a translation of divine being, but what it means is God, actually. Divine being means a God, not a creator, like a one supreme sort of idea, but a divine one. And they understand that the present body is similar in essence to grass, trees, walls, rocks, or visual aberrations. When they observe the body, they understand that the nature of the body is non-arising, and so they do not instigate any contemplation that involves notions of the body. Those who do not instigate contemplation will not dwell on any concerns. Free from concerns and with a consciousness that does not dwell, they train in observing the body and focusing mindfulness on it, yet they neither cultivate nor eliminate anything at all. Having understood that all things are without reality, intrinsic reality, they observe the body with the understanding that the body that observes the body, that the, I'm sorry, that the mind that observes the body is also just like a magical illusion of an echo. With this wisdom, they are neither attached to pleasant cessations nor hostile to painful ones. And since they are also not confused with respect to sensations that are neither painful nor pleasant, they are not predisposed to misknowing, ignorance. When they are no longer transported by sensations, then this is their focus of mindfulness on the observation of cessations. So, in other words, this Mahayana version is emphasizing what I touched on when I went through on this body, the fo focus on the body and focus on the sensations, that the actual sensation, the actual body, as you move around within the conceptual map of the body, as you move around within your imagination of the feeling in your knee, the feeling in your butt when you're sitting, the feeling in your hip, the feeling in your back, where you're imagining your back, in a way, when you go there. But when you actually look for the sensation, it sort of seems to dissolve. So here, in the Mahayana, they're already aware of the dissolution, the lack of intrinsic objectivity, if you will, which they use a term like that for, intrinsic reality, intrinsic objectivity, intrinsic referentiality. And they are aware of that. So they still focus on the sensation, in a, in a relativistic, illusory way, in a more relaxed way, rather than trying to pinpoint it, because they know that it can't be pinpointed. It can be found in a, like, like you find your reflection in a mirror. You find it, but you know that's not you. And yet you will touch your cheek on the right cheek here, because you see something on the left cheek there. So, and you'll, we don't have to think right, left, reverse, mirror image. You automatically do it, even though what you know, what you're looking at is illusory, right? So you know that it's not you at the same time as you're acting as if it is you, and you're using it to touch yourself. You follow me? So here, even touching this self is a kind of illusion, cheekbone, in the Mahayana level. It's a, it's a little deep, deeper level. So that's how they focus their mindfulness on the observation of sensations. This translation, which I'm quoting, which is not mine, but they are at least using the word focus, I'm happy to see. As they observe and dwell on sensations, their minds are not moved by any movement of their sensations about things. And as their minds therefore do not dwell upon anything, they do not abandon, discard, or relinquish the spirit of enlightenment. Period of enlightenment being that urge to achieve for the sake of others, to achieve the focus of mindfulness, to achieve the insight of the vipassana, of the nature of reality, for the sake of sharing it with others, so others can find their become 
overcome their psychosis of being separated from reality and find their own lucid awakeness and awareness of reality. How about that? This is their focus of mindfulness on the observation of the mind. They realize, in a way, the mind itself is an illusion, <laughs> the way it seems to be there. It is a subjectivity. Relationally, it's a process. But when I think I'm focusing on it, I can't find it. So I'm aware of that as I observe it, that I'm just observing an illusory process. Just like when I observe the mirror image, I know I haven't found myself, but it's the illusion of myself in the image. Right? How great. I'm so glad we went into that in detail last time. Please remember that. That mirror image to work with all the time is so important. It's so helpful to you because it shows you the subtlety and complexity of your own cognition, how you can use indirect things to deal with reality. You can use illusory things to deal with reality. This is really important because otherwise there is this way of wrongly teaching either Buddhism or Hinduism or any of these deep contemplative Indian science things, Indian psychological things, uh, about transforming your consciousness, which is that since the conceptuality, the distorted conceptuality distorts our experience, it kind of anchors our psychosis of being separate from things, of being alienated in the world from reality, and therefore projecting a reality that we fear, uh, that doesn't mean that just by somehow lobotomizing our conceptuality, sort of throwing it away, becoming the, you know, focusing on a single thing, shutting down the brain and the mind's ability to, to or, or analyze and organize things through conceptuality. Just by shutting it down, we become enlightened. Actually, by shutting it down, we become calm. We become, we can even feel a kind of pleasure from the not so much energy circling anxiously and focusedly in the mind and in the brain. We can get a buzz from that, a kind of feeling of fluency. We can go into a kind of zone. But the inner science psychologies are much more clever about it, and they realize that kind of a zone is not enlightenment. That kind of separated, alienated, sort of seemingly solidified alienated state is not enlightenment. Not at all. Absolutely not. With their knowledge of things actualized, they observe things. At that point, they are free from mindfulness and contemplation. So they understand things' intrinsic nature as freedom from intrinsic nature. That is their intrinsic nature. nature. It's freedom. They, it's emptiness, freedom. They no longer entertain any notions, contemplations, views, or entanglements with respect to body, sensation, mind, or mental things, the four focuses. This is their focus of mindfulness on the observation of things. So in other words, they combine the perception of relational perception of things with the awareness of freedom from real perception of things. So they are able to observe them as an illusory process free of any intrinsic solidified reality. So they keep their blissfulness of freedom while engaging with things responsibly because it's blissful. So they can afford to be responsible. It's not a suffering for them to be responsible and to be not separated and to be connected in, a, in an appropriate, pleasant way, an agreeable way. It's wonderful, really. So the Buddha's, then I have under heading the last part of it, the Buddha's therapeutic protocol. As we, that's the end of that quote. <clears throat> As we explore the four focuses of mindfulness, it's worth pointing out that the four noble truths, the friendly facts, are not a religious credo or a prescription for conversion, but a clear-cut psychotherapeutic protocol for pragmatic psychosomatic therapy designed to lead people out of suffering to enjoy the nirvanic reality of the world. That's right, suffering of alienation from reality 
by feeling separate from it and projecting into it a fearsome quality that you fear and you're anxious about. So you, you resort to and you, you revel in your separation, actually, and you enjoy your psychosis, so to speak, or you feel it's essential to you, so you don't try to correct it. It is intended not merely to annihilate them or to cause them to resign themselves to their misery, but rather to bring them to bliss. Resigning yourself to misery because of the first noble truth is the mistaken idea that the Pope John Paul expressed in his book, I believe, as really that chapter written by Cardinal Ratzinger, who was the high inquisitor, grand inquisitor at that time, under Pope John Paul. But the point is, the Buddhist doesn't seek to just dwell in misery. The Buddhist notes the misery of alienated experience to achieve the bliss of interconnected and relational experience and the ability to be open-minded about the kind of quasi-illusoriness of everything. Freud said his psychotherapy was to design to lead people from neurotic suffering into acceptance of regular suffering, not because he was being stingy with them, but because he had no idea that there was such a thing as fully blissful living, although maybe he thought he knew about it when he was high on cocaine, (laughs) writing some of his great books. It's well known he was addicted to cocaine, although I believe he used regular coca leaves and things. He didn't necessarily have highly refined current narcotic, which I believe is very damaging, so he was able to stay healthy. But he did chew the leaves, I think, which were not so illegal in those days. Buddha was way ahead of his time, therefore, not only and ahead of Freud's time, and ahead of our time, in providing a path beyond suffering altogether. A Buddhist term for education is taming, a giving of tools for taming the psychotic ego, teaching the relative person that she or he is not an absolute entity apart from the world around her or him. This is a far more transformative kind of education or or psychotherapy than what we are used to, one that imparts self-awareness and introduces the person to responsibility by focusing their own observation on their relational engagement in the world. So this is really fascinating in the sense that we think of psychotherapy as something for someone who's sick. So therefore we shrink from doing it because we think we're not sick. We don't want to be sick. We can run around, play football, make money and do this and that and be unhappy (laughs) and spread it to others by being in bad moods. We think that's fine. So we don't want it. So we think education is suffering through exams and school and absorbing information and this kind of thing. Whereas actually education should be therapy of our unhappiness. It should be giving us a skill of how to manage our own awareness and cure our psychosis of feeling separate from reality. And science should be introducing us to reality, not insisting that we accept a dogmatic reality, that it's material, and either our mind is disconnected from it, or even our mind doesn't even exist. The ultimate disconnection being materialistic theory that the mind doesn't really exist. It itself is a complete illusion. And so we can be content to just be a robot and follow orders, follow our programming, And of course, we get programming in school. Then we get a degree, then we can go out and make money as a robot that gets fed, (laughs) whether we're miserable or not. That's totally wrong. And, and, And it's not a matter that then that means we bring religion into it, because it's not a matter of religion. It's a matter of science, of being more realistic, and therefore really truly open minded and observing what is. And if we really try to observe what is, we will observe that we do have minds that are processes that are totally interwoven with material things and with our bodies and with our emotions and with other people and their bodies and emotions. And then we will educate people to be proper empathetic with other people, to be able to know better how to get along with them, not to harm them so as to be friendly with them and have them be friendly with us and so on and so on. That is part of education, not just giving dogmatic information and programming somebody. That's not education. 
That's programming a robot. But we are not robots, clearly. Because we don't obey, always. <laughs> it is not that therapists do not have the good will toward their patients, to nowadays the type of therapists we have nowadays, to help them become realistic and even to flourish. That's what they do want to do. It's just that the theory underlying their work makes them feel it is not possible to go further than just achieving a makeshift balance in a crazy world. So since everybody's crazy, then you have to just adapt to where you can manipulate your way past them to keep your body alive in some way. That's, that's because they're imprisoned in that theory. It has to do with the theory of the unconscious or the subconscious. Freud considered the subconscious unknowable by the conscious mind, which therefore is always relegated to being just the tip of the iceberg, inevitably driven by the powerful energies underneath it, and even afraid of the powerful energies within oneself. You know, id, the id down there has eros and thanatos and aletheia in it, you know, like stupidity, unawareness, you know, sleepwalkingness, and greed and hatred. You know, that's, hatred is Thanatos, greed is Eros, and Aletheia is stupidity and unknowingness. Freud didn't really mention that one that much, because he didn't quite realize its power. He didn't. Which is all, like Buddha did, which is, which is inevitably driven by the, but he made us scared of our id, our, our, our Eros and our Thanatos, rather than realizing that they only thrive when we feel separate from our own unconscious energies, and when we can't transform our bile and our winds, our energies, into positive and guide them into a positive way by being conscious of our unconscious, which we can be do. Mindfulness can enable us to become conscious of our unconscious and really understand how it works, and then go in there before it has built up the energy to sort of grab us through our misknown ego our psychotic ego, to drive us to behave psychotically out of greed or hatred, which is the way we live our life in an imbalanced and ineffective way. Instead of in true control of our passion and our disapproval of the negative and our, our love of the positive, which we can learn to do. Instead of just blindly slashing out in hatred and blindly grabbing harmfully to others in greed. <clears throat> we can harness Eros and Thanatos to the chariot of our wisdom and our blissfulness and our lovability and lo lovingness. The Buddhist scientific view was more thorough. Scientific view, not religious. Recognizing the situation of the ordinary person as dominated by the powerful subconscious, but also experimentally developing ways for the conscious mind to fully explore the unconscious drives, overcoming delusive misknowings and psychosis. Buddha essentially defined enlightenment as becoming fully conscious, free, able to choose the optimal way of being by focusing all energies to be beneficial for oneself and others. This is not a religious matter. It is purely scientific and clinical and arose from genius psychologists, self-explorers, who, who use mindfulness and, and, and realization to become Buddhas and, and realism to become Buddhas, wisely and lucidly awake and flourishing persons who pioneered ways of helping others find their own buddhasmic awakening. <laughs> Indeed, in order to do so, these pioneer psychologists had to break away from religions from their authority and conditioning about the nature of the human mind and the subjugation of the human being to the caprices of the various gods and their priestly mouthpieces. So, in a way, this scientific thing was critical of the religions of those days, just like we can be critical of these religions those days, but also critical of the religion of scientism. Because once science makes the dogma of materialism an absolute, it becomes a religion. It's no longer open-minded, observational, non-dogmatic, experimental, and experiential science. In, a pioneer 
So they broke away from the religions, from their authority or conditioning about the nature of the human and the sub subjugation of the human being to the caprices of the various gods and their priestly mouthpieces. Modern psychologists today, who tend to be crippled, as Freud was, by the dogma of materialism, not all of them, of course, but many of them, because that's just the orthodoxy, of the, that's the consensus of society, find it hard to imagine that the Buddhist scientists were so far ahead of them in experimentation, discovery of deep psychic realities, and technologies of psychic development, since, quote, modern, unquote, is supposed to mean, quote, advanced, unquote, and, quote, traditional, unquote, thus, is supposed to be backward. So they just lump anything remarkable seeming that was produced by these past sages under the category of, quote, pre-scientific meditation, unquote. And there are many who call themselves Buddhists who do that. Although maybe they can do that, it's okay, in the sense that at least they can get those trapped in materialism to consider looking into themselves when they will begin to perhaps discover that they have abilities that they didn't, they're not allowed to have by materialism, and then learn in that way to reject the dogma. So finally, modern Western, this, under this heading at the end of the chapter, modern Western chauvinism is a hindrance to scientific success. In other words, Western chauvinism and modernist chauvinism prevent our materialist scientists from learning any, because modernists, you can be Japanese and modernist Chinese, Indian, and they are, you know, because they think the West, since the West conquered them, has all this machinery and so forth, and can pollute everything, they're superior. And can, they have a bomb, so they must be superior, which of course is wrong. So, in other words, Western chauvinism and modernist chauvinism prevent our materialist scientists from learning anything new from the great inner scientists of India and Tibet. The belief has to change that practitioners, whether Buddhist, Hindu, Taoist, or Western mystical, just meditate, defining meditation as learning to be free from thinking as opposed to defining it as the radical transformation of the most penetrating thinking by experientially discovering the total relativity of the self. The science-oriented people discovering that and experiencing that, experimentally proving it to yourself and others, actually. The science-oriented people who do psychology and encounter Buddhism, quote, rarely Buddhism, which is not totally their fault, it's been all too rare. But anyway, the encounter Buddhism still cling to the idea that they have the ultimate psychological science, which is necessarily materialist, neuroscientific, and reductionist. While the Buddhists have meditation, but don't really know what, the, and yogis also, and Taoists, and so on, but don't really know what they are doing scientifically. Those science oriented people simply think, oh, that's just meditation, amazing. We must figure out how they do it, since they themselves don't know. <laughs> ah, so we put them in our machines, our fMRIs. We study them neuroscientifically. The main problem of modern Western mind is this. We feel we are the superior people on the planet throughout history. And history is a big deal for us, because it claims to prove that everyone else is more backward than we are. And we are on the frontier of reality about to find out the quarks and the gluons and whatever new things may be discovered. We can actually destroy the planet we have found, and some of us are proud of it. With this belief system comes the notion that we have nothing to learn from anybody in a pre-modern scientific sense. And even though some of us decry and condemn the destructiveness of the direction we are taking, we still feel we are going to reinvent the wheel of how we are going to save ourselves. The bottom line when it comes to realistic mindfulness or remembering is that the more you learn about reality, the more you have a chance of being free from suffering. This is what the Buddha discovered, and it is not religion. Religion is not defined as coming to an understanding of reality, usually nowadays modern religion. It's, it's defined as being allowed to engage in some fantastic unreality because it makes you feel good. That's how religion is defined today, but that's not 
That's, that's not what Buddhism is anyway, nor is it what any of the mystical traditions are when you had actual contemplative performers who actually encountered reality beyond the sort of socially, culturally defined fearful thing that patriarchal, militaristic societies force you to think, project into reality as the nature of God or the nature of things, a nature of nature. Actually, science is defined as that, as the attempt to understand reality at its deeper level. Science is not defined as the dogma of materialism, simply. It is not. That they will say that to you if you try to say this is science, not religion. No, but you're not materialistic, so you're not scientific. But that's just a false definition. Dogma is what the Enlightenment went against two or three hundred years ago. So they should get rid of their dogma of materialism. Science is only the attempt to under the work, the attempt, the process of trying to understand reality at its deepest levels. There's a lot more to be said about the Buddhist psychological science, but let's now move on to the top peak of the path where it all comes together. Realistic samadhi, one-pointed super concentration. And I think I can still go on with that because... Uh, we've only done half an hour, so we move into the next chapter, Realistic Samadhi. In this one thing, we're making part, almost at the end. Probably going to be two more, though. Here we are, finally comes a Realistic Samadhi. I already defined Samadhi in the last lesson, but just to do it again, Sam means all together. A means aiming, addressing some particular thing, and D means intelligence. Awareness. So samadhi means a focused intelligence that incorporates everything. That's samadhi. Which then we sometimes say you can gloss it as one-pointed because it means it has a grip on everything. But in a way, since everything is infinite, it means completely open to everything. It means there's no difference between you and everything, actually, ultimately, the highest level of samadhi. It's an infinite state which is therefore beyond the state, in a way. It's, in, it's inexpressible. You can say infinite state, but when you say state, it means a state apart from a different state, something bounded, separate from everything else. So in a way, it's not a state. It's just being infinite. It's the infinite lifestyle. It's the infinite mind style. The open mind, which is utter open-mindedness. That's what samadhi really is. Single-pointed open-mindedness. Here we finally come to the summit of the Eightfold Path, realistic samadhi concentration. We must remember that it is completely connected to the first branch, the realistic worldview of absolute relativity. Right? Absolute relativity. So that's why when we think of concentration, we think of boiling down to a point. And the ekagrata, they even say in Sanskrit, one-pointedness, ekagrata. And although... When you think one pointed, though, remember what a point is. An exact point, X, Y, Z, in s point is a spatial idea. Point in time is a moment or a split second. Split second, not a second, but a split second. And so we know that exact split second in time, exact X, Y, Z point in space, has no size. So it actually, it technically is not there. It's therefore openness to all space. It's therefore the openness to infinity. Precisely that point as touching infinity. So it's the inconceivable thing where it's an exact location which is everywhere. Not in a place apart from other places. So there's no more separation. And it's not in a time apart from other times. So there's no, there's no absolute presence. Time is absolute, all time, eternity. It's just as space is infinity. Absolutely. And infinity, however, doesn't exclude relativity. And things being illusorily relational. If you will, infinity is the mirror surface. And eternity is the mirror surface in time. Infinity is the mirror surface in space. And in that there is an illusion 
an illusory image of a relational thing that's apart from other things. But if it's known as an illusion, one can reach beyond and simultaneously hold the infinity with the finitude. Completely fulfilled in the finitude because it's not separate from infinity. So that is why wisdom is bliss. You could even be in the moment of death, actually. You could be in the death of departing your body and realizing the infinity of your body and therefore abandoning the relational one and being in a kind of infinite state. And actually, to be in an infinite state, you don't have to expand to infinity. You can expand to any degree or not expand because it's all illusory. And you can't, from a point, you can't expand to infinity. You can only know that that point is infinity. You're already in infinity. Because obviously, in a, in a motion of a progression from here to infinity, you never will reach. Because it, there's no place to reach. And yet, you're permeated by infinity. Like right now, I'm a finite person. I'm talking, and the floor is not talking. But... I'm also infinite because infinity cannot be excluded from any boundary of mine. Infinity is not excluded from the sound that my voice makes and that resonates in the round in the floor. That's all part of infinity. And yet it's in its different, illusorily differentiated. It's only illusory because when I see it, I think this is separate from the other thing. And I can work with that separation in a beautiful way when I don't worry about being separate from infinity. It's like I can live when I don't worry about death because I realize that death, my life is death. It's permeated by death simultaneously. So a moment of where I actually change bodies is no big deal for me because I'm already, my body's changing at all, every second. The cosmic rays are going through it. Atoms are... <laughs> crashing into each other. Black holes, even the scientists think dark matter is in there somewhere, some mini black hole, micro black holes, infinitesimal black holes, infinitesimal and infinite same. And that is blissful because it's free. And it's free also to be connected and to undergo some limitations if it's beneficial. Because that's not, you haven't left infinity. And then you can cultivate. Because you have the time, as you're, you're eternal. You can cook the always changing, but eternal, and you're always changing. You can keep changing in such a way as to be optimally beneficial to infinite others, ultimately. Beyond the ability of a separated God, a psychotic God who thinks he's God and the other people are not. And the other God in a different universe is not. <laughs> That's just wonderful. So, absolute relativity. I'm sorry, I just took off on that. Without the realistic, that's inconceivable, though, because that's a contradiction, absolute relativity. It's a contradiction. It's like the speed of light is limited because the light is everywhere at a certain speed and mass becomes infinite. That's a contradiction, even though it seems very simple. Einstein said it, so it must be easy. And it seems that if the light is infinite, light is matter, it's energy or something, so it's real, it's not mind, it's light. But actually, there's no difference between mind and light and, and dark, it's not, no different either. It's all transparently infinite. Without the realistic worldview, I do want a Nobel Prize in science for solving the dark matter, light matter, bright matter, duality with transparent matter and mind and mass and energy. I want it. So I have that thought experiment. And I want it as representing Buddha and Nagarjuna and many, many others. Not just because of me. I'm just representing them. I don't really fully get it, even myself. Okay, because it's, in, it's inconceivable. But I still want the prize. Because nobody else wants to be able to dare to say it's science, but it is.
without the realistic worldview to provide the aim. Any still unrealistic samadhi would only intensify the subconscious core misknowing, meaning that we would end up even more strongly projecting intrinsic reality into everything, especially the deep sense of absolute self-identity. That is to say, our mind is so powerful, we can come up with an experience of absolute psychosis, where everything else seemed to dissolve and we didn't even feel guilty like we destroyed anything because we give ourselves up in that. So we think we're all nothing. We kind of experience ourselves as all nothing. And we feel that's a reality. And we go, we go into it as yogis and yoginis. And then when we mysteriously reappear, because unfortunately there's no way to go into nothing, we find it's a white hole instead of a black hole we had hoped for. <laughs> We're still here worrying about the parking meter and worrying about tomorrow's breakfast and our friends and loved ones and our enemies and the dangerous ones. And we somehow, it was all nothing, but it seems to be happening. Then we can go around thinking, well, we can, eventually we're going to escape to nothing. We can commit suicide if it gets too bad, because we think we'll go back to that nothing. And then we have this huge shock of being a mind in a dream state, the between state, and, we find, and then we forget everything and we're embodied in some way. And if we're too frightened, we might be embodied as a rhino or a bacteria or some really horrible thing that we will not want to be for a long time. So please don't trap yourself in nothing. If you let go into nothing, and yet you kind of have committed to realism, you realize that you had a letting go and it wasn't nothing. And the fact that you returned proves that there is no such thing as nothing. So finally you begin to understand what words mean. When you do that, you begin to become responsible. You begin to cure your psychosis. You begin the laborious process of recurring bit by bit, context by context, your psychosis. You begin to realize the absoluteness of your relativity and therefore the illusoriness of the seeming absoluteness of a specific relation, the non-absoluteness of any particular separation, the relativity of it. You are living on the surface of the mirror, which luckily turns out to be a blissful surface, not a piece of hard metal, but it's like a diamond. The bliss is like a diamond. On the other hand, without the realistic samadhi, one-pointed concentration, the realistic view would not be able to transform the subconscious unrealistic structures of our misknowing consciousness. So you really have to, in a way, the Western Enlightenment was a, was a true enlightenment, actually, throwing off those like crazy, subduing and domineering religions. It was a true enlightenment. And even the, the daringness of embracing nothingness was truly courageous. But the reifying it sort of was, the unconscious thing came and reified the nothingness into the last thing, the last absolute. And that was too bad. That was a serious mistake. That's all has kept it from being as fully courageous as it would be. So we're adding to that enlightenment the next step of sophistication moving from the dark imagination of nothingness to the transparent imagination of inconceivable clear light, bliss, void, bliss, freedom, indivisible. So we're adding enlightenment to enlightenment. That's what we're doing. And that's where His Holiness Dalai Lama is the great teacher of humanity today, actually. In his constant refrain he has been doing for the last 50, 60 years, of saying he really wants the Indian inner science to meet in mutual respect to the modern outer science. 
to the Western modern outer, but now global outer science. That is spiritualistic science meeting materialistic science, both embracing each other as science, and therefore scientist, the qualification for scientist becomes to become a yogi and a yogini and to be able to realize personally the quantum foam, to realize personally absolute relativity, to develop personally em true empathy, which is called clairvoyance, telepathy, etc. Develop the mental powers, supernormal mental powers, not supernatural, supernormal mental powers. Expand the definition of nature to include the sat super subtle, the mental. And then really put a stop to the renegade rogue materialists who are polluting the planet past life sustainability and who are endangering human beings with, with weapons that are beyond military usability. Those two types of humans are no longer tolerable on this planet. And if the scientist has the power of mind to really be able to know how to communicate that forcefully enough where they will really realize that. Not to kill them or something because then another one will take their place. To persuade them to desist, to retreat from the invaded territory, to share the land, not to kill the owner of the land. That can be done everywhere. And they, they are also human beings, the mad dictators. They can, and since once they change, then all the chain of command under them changes. So it's better to convince them. them. Of course, maybe, Buddhist way is maybe you have to chain them in the chair to get them to listen. Because they might shoot you right away where you couldn't have a chance to explain. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be forced to watch don't Look Up, enlightening movies like Don't Look Up, which is one of the best films showing the destructive power of deny, living in psychotic denial of reality. Excellent. It's hypothetical, but it's excellent. It shows people destroying themselves by insisting on living in denial. And then the dictator won't look, watch that. But then they have, so there might be a little bit restraining force, not murderous force, but restraining force over such people. They need true rehabilitation, not just imprisonment, physical imprisonment where the mind is left stewing, but actual rehabilitation, real therapy. But maybe, you know, protocols for the criminally insane, since they've killed a lot of people. But not exterminating them. No capital punishment. Okay, okay. We have learned and analytically meditated enough in the super education and wisdom on the first two branches of the path, realistic view and realistic motivation. We have grown to respect the word and so have super educated ourselves in the ethics of speech and body and made it practical with our livelihood. So our lives are sensibly prioritized and stabilized socially with realistic speech, realistic evolutionary action, and realistic livelihood. We have realistically turned our creativity inward into transforming ourselves and so the world. And we have realistically cultivated mindfulness, going into our unconscious even, the deeper level of it, remembering what is going on in our mind and freeing ourselves from being stuck exclusively in the past or future through memories, endless ruminations, and fantasies, anxious anticipations, by now we are lucidly awake. But all seven components, though vibrantly activated, have not yet penetrated deep enough within to have transformed the unconscious into our conscious lucid wakefulness, letting us become fully aware of our subconscious and so realize the inner freedom from individual, from involuntary reactive drives so we can freely deploy all our formerly repressed energies toward positive accomplishments. We need such freedom to fully transform ourselves into a bliss being, a Buddha who can lift up the ordinary world itself, 
This is the power of meditative concentration. When we reside in this state, we are introduced to the freedom that already exists, such that we can wake up to bliss. Let's explore what we mean when we talk about meditation. Meditation brings it all to depth is a heading now. There are a number of words in Sanskrit that people translate as meditation. And in English, we mainly know about one point in meditation from the East and are somewhat aware of critical analytic meditation as in, the De as in the, that of Descartes and so many other great minds. There is Vipassana, the Sanskrit version of the famous Pali, Vipassana, literally a seeing through, which is analytic meditation that considers thing, things in order to know them realistically. I had a colleague at Amherst College, Bill Pritchard, who despised religion and therefore despised me and the religion department. <laughs> but yet he wrote a book on modern literature, poetry and prose, called Seeing Through Everything. And art, other, I think he included Picasso and Pointillistes and, and abstract expressionists and things, I think. But I, I didn't read everything because I was also feeling alienated, separated from him. But I always loved the title of his book, and I realized he was really on the same plane of Vipassana, seeing through everything. Because the great poets, it doesn't take a Buddhist. The great artist sees through the superficially conceptualized and programmed and, cultural and psychotic culturally conditioned realities, sees the deeper beauties, or even the, the, the deeper ugliness, which is so emotionally stirring and in a way becomes beautiful and transcending. Even ugliness can be transcendent. And they have seen that and therefore they see through everything. I'm sure he was teaching that. Without thinking that this must actually fits with the inner science of a higher culture that is not that of a Amherst College. Except a little infiltrated through philosophy and religion departments, maybe, and maybe East Asia or South Asian departments. There are very few South Asian ones. There is shamatha, serenity, but I want to shout out for Bill Pritchard because of the title of his book. Maybe I'll finally have time to read it now that I'm retired. There is shamatha, serenity, literally staying in peace, which focuses on one thing and gradually disidentifies with and rules out distracting thoughts and leads the meditator into a state of physical and mental fluency that can be mistaken for the ecstasy of enlightenment. There is samapati, these are Sanskrit words in other words, all of which can sometimes be translated meditation. Total production or immersion, which is best translated as trance actually. And I like to use the word for one-pointedness as entrancement. Oh, I'm so, that's so entrancing. Because we all can be entranced with something we truly love, can't we? We become hypnotized by it. And that's when we become one-pointed, actually. Because we love it so much. We can become entranced in a great work of art and lose ourselves in it. And that, that is moving to a larger relational self. We move into fully identifying empathetically with the hero or the heroine or the or whatever it is, you know, through great art. And that's entrancement, and that's samapati. So that's samapati, total production or immersion of a state which is best translated as trance. The Buddha taught a famous set of four entrancements in the formless states, which are infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing whatsoever, and neither just conscious nor just unconscious which are what the Western Enlightenment people arrived at. Those scientists had yogic experiences that nothing was just as important as some terrifying hell thrown at them by the church and the king and their psychotic culture in Europe of those days. Hierarchical, militaristic, violent, and female suppressing culture of Europe in those days. So they reached that, actually. Even only split second, they felt nothing was more real than the bullshit that was being handed to them. Then they, did, they unfortunately didn't disappear into it, and they wrote the 
take our meditation. He said, well, I'm thinking, so I'm still here. <laughs> I couldn't find my mind. I'm thinking, well, I'm still here. I think therefore I am. Very brilliant. Wonderful. The inner science. Okay. But not the dogma that what the, the reality was the nothing. No. Because those formless states are not, are not reality. They are actually psychotic states. At one point in this, the mind is so powerful, it can produce a state. It can take the psychosis at one step further with it seems like the whole, the whole of reality. State of separateness. But clearly it's separate. When someone reaches that, they don't destroy everybody else. So it, actually everything isn't nothing, in fact. <laughs> Uh, but they, but they, it's such a powerful experience for them that they think it is afterwards. So then they get stymied in changing their basic habits in relationality. They don't realize that, that the dark matter of that experience is right here, transparently within the bright matter. So they don't keep the bliss of the feeling of escape, which is only the first instant of it. After that, it's boring. And you come back from it, you wake up from it. Whereas when you really, you have that, the, the threshold experience at all times while still here, that's the bliss. The release is exponential within relativity. Responsible and loving relativity. It is the love of everything. So cool. Then there is dhyana, which they tend to contempl call contemplation, which resonates through East Asia to us as Chinese Chan, Korean Zen and Japanese Zen. Korean son and Japanese Zen, everywhere nowadays in popular culture. It is, of course, meditation or contemplation, which is the fifth bodhisattva transcendence, and can include both one pointedness and discursive analysis, both shamatha and vipassana. There is also a famous set of four contemplations, which are important for dhyanas, consisting of realistic samadhi, contents of real, important contents of realistic samadhi, namely immense love. Immense compassion, immense joy, and immense equanimity. And those are before you go into the complete escape states. But they are, they are sort of like, that, those are all included within the boundary of infinite space. But they're infinite space, still infused at first conceptually with love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And then that's the one which then becomes everything. That immensity when you know absolute relativity. It becomes all of life. It becomes the four elements, earth, water, fire, wind. So brilliant, so fabulous. Finally, there is bhavana. This is the really important one, which comes from a verb to be or to become, from bu, which is bu. And bhava means a thing that it bees, that is. And is often translated itself also as meditation. Even into Tibet, it was translated into a word that was similar to familiarizing or meditating, gom, similar to kom. But actually, it's, and therefore often people from Tibetan will conflate that bhavana with just familiarizing, so with, with dhyana. But it's beyond dhyana, actually, because it's actually where one pointed, where shamatha and vipassana come together, and you create the state that you are, focusing on. So you just become love, you become compassion, you become joy, you become equanimity. You don't, you, or you become nothing, or you become space, or you become this and become that. Bhavana means therefore to realize, you make it real. And so the ultimate making real is not any of these separate psychotic states, the ultimate making real is breaking out of your psychosis and making infinity real with infinitude. Infinitude real within infinity, non-dually as the same thing, in which therefore the only way to relate infinitely to finitude is to love it. To know it is to love it. That is non-misknowing, when, when you can embrace that dichotomy, when you can embrace that inconceivable duality in actual when you, when you can live on the surface of the mirror of infinity and be finite in a loving and responsible, wise way. So that's bhavana. 
So meditation, but actually it might be better translated in some contexts, and in fact most of them, as realization, to make something real or bring it into being. Thus, when you understand something by reasoning intellectually, that is itself important, but the understanding needs to be brought down from head to heart and to, to whole of body, needs to be realized, made real for your whole being. Okay, so good. So this, this I will cease this session. I'm very good on real. We will realize this in this session. We will come to it. We will not finish in the next session. I will do another session, but we won't finish. And so we will begin here again. And now we dedicate ourselves to the full realization of infinite finitude, finite infinity, absolute relativity, relative absoluteness, uh, relative absoluteness, and which means becoming Buddhas, becoming fully aware and fully loving, fully awake and fully loving while fully asleep even, being awake even and while asleep and asleep while awake, being dead while alive and alive while dead, and therefore fearing nothing, loving everything, which is Buddhahood, quickly to do that, to be able not to somehow be better than anybody else, all the psychos, to become an enlightened psycho, to help others realize they can become enlightened, the other psychos, non-violently, as quickly as possible. That's how we dedicate it. Any merit we have, any new understanding, any aha, any anything we have gotten in this. And I'm delighted that, I can, that, I, that this stimulates this, can stimulate it if we really work with it, if we're really open-minded about it. We dedicate that to make everyone equal, to be equal to everyone else. Love them all.